Hello everyone and welcome to today's Python for Data Analysis Beginner Level Workshop. My name is Alex and I am your instructor in today's session. So we start our day with talking about how to approach learning Python. Then we will look at Python as a programming language. What exactly is Python and how is Python used? Then we dive into data types in Python. We talk about variables. We move on to operators, and then we talk about how we use numbers in Python. Once we are done talking about numbers, we will dive into string data type. And then we look at some of the commonly used string methods. We look at slicing. Then we also work with a format function, as well as we learn some casting in Python. Subsequently, we are going to work on the mini project and it will be a simple one because we are only using what we have learned up to this moment. And what we're doing is to write a Python script for a bill payment system. As we come close to the end of our time today, I would provide you with certain some tips that you may not be aware of when it comes to getting a job or switching into a data related field. Finally, I will provide you with some resources that takes you from where you are at the end of this workshop to you becoming an expert in Python. There are no requirements or prerequisites for learning Python or completing this course. There are applications that we need, but these are free applications that will be downloaded from the internet in the coming videos. Having said that, you certainly need a computer as this course is designed to be ends on and you are expected to code along with me. Now, while all you need is one computer, because you will be watching the tutorial videos, that means you will either have to toggle back and forth between the tutorial videos and Jupyter Notebook where you will be writing your codes or you can split your computer screen between both. Alternatively, if you have a tablet or a second computer, it certainly would be much easier to watch the tutorial videos on the tablet and code on your computer. I'm certainly not asking you to go buy another tablet or a second computer, just saying that if you do have one already, then it would make your learning experience even better. In my experience, installing applications is one of the barriers beginners face in learning a new programming language. Luckily for us, we won't have that problem. All we need is one simple and quick download and installation. The name of the application we are downloading and installing is Anaconda. Once we install Anaconda, we will launch Jupyter Notebook, which is a graphic user interface that allows us to write and run Python codes. The next video walks you through that installation. You only need to watch the installation video based on your operating system, so either Windows or Mac. From your browser, go to Google and type download Anaconda in the search box. The first link should be anaconda.com with a pathway to individual edition. Click on the link. Scroll to the bottom of the page and you should see Anaconda installers. You will be able to select the download file for Windows. As at the making of this video, the most recent edition is 3.8. The edition you see would be the most recent edition and may not be 3.8, which is fine. Click on 64 bits graphical installer and the file should be downloaded within a minute or two, depending on your internet speed. Once the application is downloaded, double click to run the installation file. Click on next. And you'd have to agree to the terms and conditions. And I'll click on next. Click on next. And go ahead and install the application. And this might take a few minutes for the installation to be completed. Now we have our installation completed, click on next and click next. And now we can finish the installation. We have successfully installed Anaconda. 
now we can launch Jupyter Notebook, which is an application hosted by Anaconda that enables us to write and run Python codes. To launch Jupyter Notebook, click on your start menu and scroll down to Anaconda. Click on the drop down menu and right there you see Jupyter Notebook. I'm gonna open that up. And now we have Jupyter Notebook opened. The next thing I'd like to do is to pin Jupyter Notebook to my taskbar. That way I can have quick access to, to Python. Now the next step would be for us to open up a file. Now when you launch a Jupyter Notebook, you won't see all of these files that I have here. That is because I had installed Jupyter Notebook previously and I have all these files. Now next thing is you can click on New, click on Python 3, and this should launch a new file where you can start writing your Python codes. In the next video, I'll walk you through the Jupyter Notebook environment and we'll start learning how to code in Python. Hey there, in this video, I will walk you through installing Python on your Mac operating system. From your browser, go to google.com and type download Anaconda in the search box. The first link should be anaconda.com with a pathway to individual edition. Go ahead and click on the link. Scroll to the bottom of the page and you should see Anaconda installer. You will be able to select a download file for Mac. As at the making of this video, the most recent edition is 3.8. The edition you see would be the most recent edition and may not be 3.8, which is fine. Click on 64-bit graphical installer and the file should be downloaded within a minute or two, depending on your internet speed. Once the application is downloaded, open your download location. For me, that would be my download folder. Double click to run the installation package. If you get this pop-up stopping the installation, you don't have to worry. All you need to do is to give permission for Anaconda to be installed on your computer. Click System Preferences and click on Security and Privacy. And you can see here yeah, that Anaconda was blocked. Now click on open anyway, and you might need to enter your computer password for this to be completed. Now just click on continue. And now we can start installing the package. Click on continue and you'd have to agree to some terms and conditions. Just click on continue and continue. And of course I agree again. And you have to select a, a location where the, you want the application to be installed and then continue and install. And this might take about two to three minutes to, for the installation to be completed. And if you get a pop-up, just click OK. And this is just allowing the files to access your download folder. Now click on continue and we have our application has been successfully installed. So we can go ahead and close this and we can move the installer to trash. We don't need that anymore. I'm going to reduce this um, or minimize this. And now let's open up uh, Anaconda. So just click on Launchpad and type Anaconda in the search box. Double click to launch the application. So we have Anaconda initializing or launching. And it's just gonna take a few seconds for that to happen. Once Anaconda is launched, what we notice is that there are several applications that are hosted by Anaconda, but all we need is Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is a graphic user interface that enables us to write and run Python codes.
We now have Jupyter Notebook launched and the next thing I would like to do is to dock Anaconda that way I can quickly access Python. Next I will create a folder on my desktop where I can save my Python files. And I'm just going to minimize this. And now I will go ahead and click new folder and I'll call this folder my Python files. Once the folder is created, now we can go back to Jupyter Notebook and click on desktop. And what we want to do is um, give access to our desktop. And now we can select that folder. And what happens is that now we can create files that will be saved in this folder. So whatever Python script we write, we can save them in this folder. To create a Python file, click New, then click Python 3. All right, so we're all set to start learning Python. And in the next video, I will walk you through Jupyter environment. Then we start coding in Python. Hey there, in this video, we will go through the Jupyter Notebook environment. Once you launch Jupyter, you should be presented with this page. On the left, you would have some folders and some of these folders are connected to folders on your computer. I also have some files right here. You shouldn't have this um, or have, have files if this is the first time you're launching Jupyter Notebook. This is because I created those files. Since you'll be working with Python, you may choose to create a folder where you save all your Python files. To do that, click on New and click Folder. Right here, uh, your, your untitled folder is created for you. I'll check the box next to that file, to the folder, click on rename, and I can call this my Python folder. Click on rename, and now you can see that this folder has been renamed and created for you. To create a file, a Python file, we can go inside of this folder, and now we can have all our Python files stored inside of this folder. Trick to create a new Python file, click on new, click on Python 3, and the new page will be launched, which will be a new file. And this is where we write our Python codes. We have some menu at the top that drops down. We have some shortcuts. And we have a cell, and this is typically where you would type your Python codes. Let's go through some of the drop down menu. For, when you click on file, we have for, so right here we can also create a new Python file. We can open an existing one, make a copy, save, and rename. And what we can do is we can also we can choose a name for this file. Let's say uh, we can call this my first. I'm just going to call this my first script. When you click on rename, you see that that name changes. We can also create or choose a name for the file by clicking file. And you right now, because it's named, we can just click on rename. And if we want, we can call this, uh, let's say, my first Python code. And then click on rename. If we click on edit, Within edit, we can cut a cell, we can copy a cell, um, we can merge a cell, and uh, you know, again, there, there's a bunch of things we can do right here. And on the view, this helps us to toggle the edits. And if we click on insert, we can insert a cell above or below. So if I click below, you see a new cell is inserted. Let's um, let's say I let's say I'm gonna write one plus two. Now, if we want to execute or this query or this expression, uh, there are a couple of ways we can do that. We can either click on run, which gives us the answer three, or let's say two plus four. I can also enter shift, so press shift and enter on your keyboard and that runs that cell. So either you use the, the run icon right here, or you can use shift and enter on your keyboard or command enter on your keyboard. And of course, um, we can also run the cell by using this drop down. But of course, um, 
this would be faster or just entering shift enter on your keyboard kernel is an important menu um, because sometimes if you accidentally run the wrong code or you make certain changes within your code it could crash Jupyter notebook and what happens is that you you may notice that Jupyter is non-responsive or it takes longer than usual for a code to be executed you can refresh uh, Jupyter notebook by restarting kernel and all you need to do is click on kernel and you have the option to simply restart you can restart and clear the output you can also just restart and run all the cells so uh, anytime you notice that nothing is happening within your Jupyter notebook simply go to kernel and restart Jupyter notebook if we look at help this will if you want to learn some of the keyboard shortcuts you can click on this option so you have all those different options for you to learn about Jupyter notebook uh, and now one shortcut I would like to also show you is uh, earlier on we saw how to um, insert a new cell above or below you can also use a keyboard shortcut to do that for that first press escape on your keyboard and what happens is that you see that this color changes to blue which is a command mode once we are in the command mode if you want to create a cell above the cell all you need to do is enter a on your keyboard and a new cell is and that might not be clear now but I'm just going to copy this and paste this again so let's say we want to insert a new a new cell above we just press first we press escape to go to the command mode and when we press a now we can see that a new cell has been inserted above if we want to insert a new cell below again we click escape to switch to command mode and now we press b the keyboard the key b on your keyboard and a new cell is inserted below uh, another thing i would like to show you is if you look at this um, this box it shows you that this you know we're right now in a code mode which means we are typing whatever is in the cell is expected to be a code well there might be times that we just want to say type a, a header or say, um, I might want to say and I'm just going to type any some random so my first Python and right now if this is not a code I can change this to markdown and what happens is that Python will not interpret this as a code. So you can sort of use this as an editor, if you will. And now if you want to then write something, which is a code, then all we need to do is switch this to code, which it is now. Jupyter Notebook automatically saves your script. So you, for the most part, won't have to worry about saving um, your script once you type any code but you can always click on the save icon to do that to close Jupyter notebook all you need to do is click on file and you can click close and alt and that closes that file you can return to the main screen by clicking on the link to root folder and this brings you back to the main folders or to the main screen Python is a multi-purpose programming language and we will talk more about that shortly but what that really means is Python can be used for different purposes. It can be used for data analysis, web development, building software applications, and a lot more. Because Python is a multi-purpose programming language, you somewhat need to choose a learning pathway. If your goal is to use Python for data analysis, then your immediate focus would be to learn the aspect of Python used for data analysis. Of course, you can always focus on other areas of Python as your learning evolves. Having said that, regardless of which area of Python you want to learn, be it web development, data analysis, or software development, there is what we call standard or general Python, which is the foundation on which all the different learning pathways are built upon. Which means that anyone who needs to use Python in any capacity needs to know st the standard or the general Python before focusing on a specific area. Think of it this way. We have Python as a multipurpose programming language. So you learn standard or general Python, which is foundational. 
then you branch out and focus on the pathway you want. That means for us, we also need to start our Python journey learning the standard Python. Although we are starting with standard Python, we are going to approach our study from a data analysis perspective. As mentioned earlier, Python is a general purpose programming language, which means Python can be used for a wide variety of functions. Python is heavily used in software development. There are countless mobile and desktop applications solely built using Python. Another area where Python is used is in website applications. From building a simple website to a complex website with advanced features, you can rely on Python to get the job done. Python is also exceeding other data analytics languages as the primary choice of data analysis because of the ease of use, the flexibility, and vast functionality possible with Python. When you think about big data, AI, and, and machine learning, Python has several libraries that makes it easy and makes it the perfect choice for data scientists, data analysts, or anyone working with data. And I should say, this is by no means all what we can use Python for. There are several other uses for Python. One of the reasons why Python is becoming the choice language for data analysis is because of the ease of use. Although Python is a high level language and can be used for a complex task, Python is really easy to learn, which makes it beginner friendly. Compared to some other programming languages, Python has simple syntax and you would generally need fewer lines of code to perform the same tasks that would take you longer and perhaps need more complicated codes in, in some other programming languages. Python codes are readable and interactive and can be used across different platforms, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Data type is an attribute used to classify different types of data. There are three main data types in Python. We have int data type, which stores integers. Integers are numbers without fraction or all numbers. For example, the numbers eight minus 50 can be stored as an int data type. Int data type can store both negative or positive values and the keyword int, int, is used to represent integer data type. Next, we have the float data type, which store numbers that has decimals and also stores both positive or negative values. We use the keyword float to represent a float data type. An example of a float data type will be 3.4, negative 14.8. The next data type is the string data type. We store character or text values within a string data type. As indicated here, we have the text or the characters server left for New York. This will be considered a string data type. There's one more data type that is very important in Python, and that is the Boolean data type. Boolean can take on two values. The first value is true, and the second value is false. The keyword bool, B-O-O-L, is used to represent a Boolean data type. Before we switch over to Jupyter Notebook and work with these data types, I'd like us to create a folder on our desktop where we can store our Python codes. All right, so on my desktop, I'm going to create a new folder by right clicking. I click on new and click on folder. And I'll come out, let's call this Python. And this is where we will store our Python codes as files. The next step would be to launch Jupyter Notebook, which is the application we need to write our Python codes. You all should have received an email with a video link on installing Jupyter Notebook. Now the way this workshop is structured is such that you can code along with me. The next step would be for us to launch Jupyter Notebook. I already have Jupyter Notebook pinned to my taskbar. Now, if you are yet to pin Jupyter Notebook to your taskbar, that's not a problem. Just simply click on file and then click on, um, you should see the package, the Anaconda package, because that's inside the Anaconda package is where you find Jupyter Notebook. And when you click on the drop-down menu, 
you should have Jupyter Notebook and you can either launch from here. If you want to pin it to your taskbar, click on right, right click, click on uh, move your mouse to more and then you see the option to pin to your taskbar. Okay. Once you launch Jupyter Notebook, you should, a web page that looks like this should appear. Now, on the left, you have different folders, and some of those folders are attached to folders on your computer. If you are using a MacBook, you should see the desktop folder listed here as well. Once you click on the desktop folder, that should give you access to the Python folder we created on your desktop. If you're using Windows, you won't see desktop here. All you need to do is click on OneDrive. Once you click on OneDrive, you should see desktop. Now, when you click on desktop, now you can see the Python folder that we just created. For us to create files inside of the Python folder, because that's what we want to do. We want to save our codes inside of this Python folder. All we need to do is go inside of that folder. Now from here, we can click on new, click on Python 3, and a new Jupyter notebook would be open where we can write our Python codes. The first thing I would like us to do is to name this file. And to do that, we can click on Untitled. This is where we, you click, if you click on Untitled, you now have the option to give this file a, a name that we want. So let's call those data types. And I'm gonna click on Rename. Another way to name this file would have been to click on File, and then we have the option to Rename, all right? The next thing I would like us to do is, well, first, this is the cell where we write our Python codes. Right now, we only have one cell, and we wouldn't need, need more than one cell. For us to create more cells, press Escape on your keyboard, and press B, the letter, the letter B, and that's going to create cells below the first cell. If you want to create cells above the first cell, so let's say, for instance, I'm just going to write... Um, just going to write one plus one. Now, if we want to create a cell above this cell that we currently have one plus one, all we need to do again, we press escape, it changes the cell to command mode. As you can see, the color changes. And now if you enter the key A or letter A, we can see that new cells are created above the, the first cell we add. Now, I'm just going to delete this. Some minutes ago, we talked about four different data types. We talked about the int, the float data type. We talked about the string data type, as well as the Boolean data type. So we know that int data type contains all numbers, numbers without decimal, so, and it could be positive or negative. So the number five would be a, a, an integer, and um, also a negative number like minus 24 is an integer. In Python, we have a way of checking or validating the type of data that we are working with. Yes, we know that these are integers, right? Just because of the way I've, I defined it to you. But we can also use what we call the type function to confirm the data type that we are working with. So we have type and so we have the type function really, you know, we have the name type and then we have the parenthesis. I'm going to remove those five. So this is the type function. Now, any value we pass inside of the parenthesis, Python is going to reveal for us once we execute the cell what the data type is. So now let's say we want to find out the type, the data type of the value 10. When we execute and the way to execute the cell, there are two ways we can do that. We can either click on run and it's going to tell us that this is int, which means integer. And let's check the, so I, I showed you one way to execute the cell, which is to click on run. The other way would be to type, to enter, shift, enter. So you press them shift on your keyboard and enter at the same time. So let's check the data type of minus 24. So again, we have type, we open and close our parenthesis. And when I press shift and enter, it's going to tell me that this is also an integer. The other data, the next data type we talked about was float. So let's use the type function again. So we have type, and this time let's check for the let's check the data type of 4.5. When we execute, and I again press Shift Enter, 
Python is going to tell us this is a float data type. And even if this was a negative value, it's still going to be a float as long as it's got decimal. The other data type we looked into was the, the, the string data type, which is for text. So let's say we have, again, let's have our type. And this time, let's say the text we, let's say bread, okay? Now, one thing we have to, and let's ex execute. When we execute, we're going to get an error. The reason we get an error is because anytime we are working with text data or string data, we have to embed the value, the text value inside a single or a double quote. So what that means is that right now, Python has given us this error saying that the name bread is not defined. And that's because it's not recognizing the value inside of the type function as a data as a as a data type or as a you know as as a string value that it can interpret so for us to fix this error we have to embed this value in a single quote when we now execute it's going to tell us that it is a string data type and like i said it could be a double quote as well so let's say we want to this time let's say the name alexander right and we can embed this in a double quote as well and when we execute, and what all I did was I just pressed shift and then I pressed the, the so the double quote symbol is the a symbol away from the enter key um, on your keyboard. So when I now execute, which is shift enter, it's going to tell me that this is a string data type. So something to keep in mind whenever you're working with string data type, you have to embed the values inside a single or a double quote. The next data type is the Boolean data type, which could either be true or can be false. Now, one thing I should note to tell you is that with a Boolean data type, the, the first letter T has to be uppercase for this to be a Boolean data type. So there's a difference between uppercase T and lowercase T. And you can see here that the lowercase T, like when the, the true with the lowercase T is in black, and which is really telling that this is a, a sort of like a text. And you can see that the data type true is highlighted in green. All right. Now we can also check the type and let's use the type function again. When we execute, it tells us that this is a Boolean data type and same as the false as false when we execute it tells us that it's a boolean data type as well now the reason why we don't have to embed the this in a single or double quotes is because it is considered a data type true and false is considered a data type so we don't have to embed it it's it's not it's not the same as this text bread or alexander okay and you typically with the boolean data type we would get the we, we usually would result in, in a boolean data type from an expression so let's say for instance we have the expression two is um let's say two greater than three okay when we execute the cell it gives us it tells us false so the value that we get the output we get from this expression two greater than three is a boolean data type so this is saying is two is the number two greater than the number three. And of course we know that's not true. That's false, right? So we get false. If we say is 10 greater than five, when we execute, we get the Boolean output of true telling us that yes, 10 is greater than five. Let's go ahead and close this file. I'm going to click on file, click on go close and alt. Next, let's talk about variables. Variables are used to store values. Assuming we have the value one, we can choose to store this value inside of a variable. In this case, the name of our variable is my variable. The way we store the value inside the variable is by using the assignment operator, which is the equal sign. We have this expression five plus 3.5. We can also store this expression inside of a variable. In this case, we have the same name for the variable, which is my variable, and we use the assignment operator to assign the values or the expression 5 plus 3.5 inside of my variable. We can also store a string value inside of the same variable or inside of a variable. In this case, we have I love Python, 
and we use the assignment operator to assign that value to my variable. Now, the first time we assigned the value of one to my variable, the value of one is contained inside of that variable. The next time we assign another value, in this case, we assigned five plus 3.5, the expression into the same variable. This new value or this new expression, five plus 3.5, overrides the original value of one. In the same way, when we assigned a new value of I love Python to the same variable, then the content of my variable now becomes I love Python, which means it overrides the last value, which was 5 plus 3.5. Let's go ahead and create a new file. And I will call this variables rename. I'm going to create more cells, so I have escape and below, just create a few cells. All right, so what we like to do is to create a variable. The name of the variable will be x, and we want to assign the value of five to x. So we have x, and we use the assignment operator to assign the value of five. To save the value of five inside of x, all we need to do is to execute or run our cell. Once we run the cell, the value is now saved inside of x. If we want to print out the value inside of x, which is five, we just type x. When we press shift enter, it's going to output the value for us. Let's save, let's create, uh, let's store the value of 10 inside x. When we execute, that stores it. If we want to print out the new value inside of x, we, all we need to do is execute or print x. We get the value inside of 10. So we can see now that the value of 10 has now override the value of five that was originally stored in X. Let's create another variable Y. This time we want to store the value of 25 inside of Y. To print out Y, we just type Y, shift enter, that prints that out. Now we can also do something like this, which is to add X and Y. When we execute, we get 35. And what happens is a Python goes into the variable X, it says the value of 10 inside, it sees the, um, the, you know, the operator addition, right? And then it goes into the Y variable or variable Y that sees the value of 25 and it essentially adds both value together and gives us the output. Let's create another variable and we'll call this variable first value. And let's assign the, the let's, this time we wanna assign a text or a string data type and let's assign appy. Now, before I execute, the reason I have, and I'm gonna, the reason I have first underscore value is because I don't want an empty white space between first and value. And this is common with uh, most programming languages. When you are creating a, a table name or a variable, you don't want spaces between, if you are using multiple words, you don't want to, to have a white space between the first word and the second word. And that's why I have this underscore to somewhat join the first and you know and the second word together and so we assign the value of appy to first value and now we can execute and we can create a second variable and this time i'm going to call it second value and let's assign the value of birthday and execute so now we have two variables, first value and second value with separate values inside of the variables. We can also perform this expression of adding, even though what we have is a string value inside of the variables, we can still add the first and second variable together. And let me show you what I mean. So we have first value and now we can add second value. And when we execute, essentially it joins the value inside the first variable and the second variable so and this is what we call concatenation so it concatenates the first value and second value now we can see that there is no space because it's pretty much just merged both values together and by the way the output we got when we added the first variable which is first value and second value together if we want we can actually store that inside another va variable so right there i can say you know third value or you know, let's let's use something else i can say result equal so what's going to happen is that python is going to 
evaluate the expression on the right, which is to add first value and second value. Once it gets that result, then it will store it inside of the on uh, inside the variable on the left, which is results. So now when we re-execute the cell, and if we now print out results, we get the value, which is the concatenation of first value and second value. Let's talk about some of the commonly used operators in Python. But first, what are operators? Operators are special symbols used for arithmetic or logical operations. All right, let's take a look at some of the operators we have here. In the first cell, we have the assignment operator, which is the equals symbol. And this tells Python that we want to assign the value of eight to the variable X. When we execute the cell, that gets done. So the value of eight is assigned to X. So we have the assignment operator. The next cell we have, we're also assigning the expression three plus one into Y. So Python is first going to evaluate. So what we have right here is actually, so we have the addition operator, right? And this is going to tell Python that we want to add the value of three and the value of one together. Once that expression is solved, then we want to save or want to store the value or the output inside of Y. So we have the, the assignment operator and we have the addition operator. When we execute, that gets done. The next operator we have is the minus operator. And this is saying, I want to minus the value of Y from the value of X. When we execute, we get the output of four because now we have eight in X and we have four in Y. So eight minus four will give us four. The next expression is the division, sorry, well, the next exp expression X divided by Y. So we have the division operator. When it, we execute, we get 2.0. Well, it's really two. The reason we get 2.0 is just for extra precision. The next operator we have is the multiplication operator denotes by the asterisk or the star. When we execute, we get 32, which is eight multiplied by four. The next operator, we have two asterisks, and this is power of. This is saying, I want x to the power of y. So we know that x is four. So it's pretty much multiplying x by itself four times. When we execute, we get 4,096. The next operator we have is the greater than. So we have the greater than operator, and this is saying is x greater than y. When we execute, we get true because X, which is eight, is definitely greater than Y, which is four. We have the less than operator, and that's the same as X less than Y, and we get false. The last operator we have here is the comparison operator, which is denoted by two equal symbol. And what this is saying is that as the value inside of X, the same as the value inside of Y. When we execute, we get false because we know the value inside of X is eight and Y is four. So, and, and what if we say, let's assign, now let's assign the value of eight to Y and the execute. And now let's do, let's check the same expression. So we're comparing. When we now execute, it tells us true because now we have the value of eight stored as Y. As we already know, Python helps us to work with different data, one of which are numbers. When Python needs to perform a conflicting numeric operation, it needs to decide on how to proceed. Let's take a look at these expressions below. We have two plus three multiplied by five. So two plus three is five. And when we multiply five by five, we get 25. We have the same expression below, which is two plus three multiplied by five. What if we first multiply three and five, that gives us 15. And when we add two to 15, we get 17. So we have the same expressions giving us two different answers. How do you think Python would fix this? Or how do you think Python would solve this problem? Well, Python uses an order of operation, which is PEMDAS. P for parentheses, exponent, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. And the way it works is that 
parenthesis comes before exponent, and exponent before multiplication, and multiplication before division, and addition, and subtraction. So when we look at this expression, what Python does is, because multiplication comes before addition, first it adds to multiply 3 and 5, which gives 15, and then add 2 to 15, which gives 17. So when we run this, uh, ex run, run this, we get 17, because that's the way Python would do this calculation. Now, what if we want to force this um, Python to first calculate 2 plus 3? Well, we can do that by simply imputing 2 plus 3 in parentheses, because by, by order of operation, we know parentheses comes from multiplication. So this way now, 2 plus 3 will be calculated first. We get 5, and then 5 will be multiplied by 5. And this gives us 25. Let's talk more about string data type. I will create a string variable and I will be pet, that's the name of the variable, and assign the value of dogs inside our pet variable. The first thing I would like to point out is, of course, because this is a string data type, we have to embed this in either a single or double quote. The variable name does not have to be in quotes because it's, um, it's an entity on its own. So we don't have to put that in quotes. It is the, the value has to be in quotes, but, but the name doesn't have to be in quotes. The next thing I would like to talk about is this. Variable names are case sensitive. So now if we choose to retrieve the value inside of the pet variable, we know that we can print out pet and that gives us the value. What happens if we, instead of printing out lowercase pets, if we type uppercase pets, let's see what happens. When we execute that cell, we get a name error and the error says name pets is not defined. And that is because there is a difference between uppercase pets and lowercase pets. So this will be a separate, it's a separate entity. Now, if we choose, we can assign a new value and let's say we assign the value of cat to uppercase pets. Now, if we print out pets, uppercase, we get cats. So, like I said, there is a difference between a lowercase and uppercase. So, uh, whenever you're creating your variable names, just something to keep in mind, um, because this does throw off, um, you know, people are just learning how to code in Python. If we choose, we can then, you know, concat if we want, we can concatenate both um, our pets variable. So we have uppercase pet and we want to concatenate that with lowercase pet. And now we get cat dogs because we know that our uppercase pet contains cats and our lowercase pet um, contains dogs. And if we also want, we can reassign this new value to lowercase, um, to lowercase pet. So let's say lowercase pet equals uppercase pet plus pet. And when we print out lowercase pets, now we get cats, dogs. So we can also see how easy it is to change the values inside of a variable. And I suppose this is why this container is called a variable because the values of the data inside of it can vary depending on what we assign into that variable. The next thing I'd like to talk about is broken strings. And I'll explain what broken strings mean. Say we have this sentence. Now we have Peter doesn't care anymore. Now we do know that for this to be a string, it has to be in either a single or a double quote. For now, I'm going to put this in a single quote. Also, one of the things we notice is that whenever we embed a string in either a single or double quote, we can see that the color changes to red. And that's sort of visible here as well. We see that Peter up to doesn't, well, up to the alphabet N changes to red, but this seems to just have a, the color did not change. And the reason is because we have a broken string. If we look at this, Python is assuming that from the from Peter, for, from the letter P up to the letter N, this is one string, right? So Python is treating this as one string and it is expecting that we add another apostrophe, another single quote right here, because as far as Python is concerned, 
this should be another string. But we know that that's not the case. So how do we fix this broken string? The way we do that is this. Whenever we expect to have a single quote inside of a string, then instead of embedding the whole string in a single quote, what we want to do is to embed it in a double quote. So if we take away the single quote and we have this in a double quote, now we see that the all the, like all the sentence is now being converted into a string. So and we know that because again the color changed to to red. Let's try another example of a broken string. Okay, so we have Peter said, I don't care why did it say that. So we know we have to embed this in quotation mark. So let's embed this in single quotes. When we do that, we notice that there still seem to be a broken piece to the string as indicated by this color black. Okay, so and the reason is because again, we have the single quote, we have double quote, and right here, Python is just confused, so the, the string is broken, okay? Why don't we embed this in double quote and see what happens? When we do that, we still get a broken part to this to the string, again, because right here we have, we're starting with double quote, and this ends, you know, Python again treats this whole thing as one string, and right now this letter I is starting without a string. So again, we have a broken, um, we have the string being broken. So how do we fix this broken string? Whenever we expect a combination of single and double quotes within our text, all we need to do is embed that text in three single quotes. So it's not, instead of using one or two, now we have to use three single quotes. To do that, I'm just going to press the single quote on my keyboard three times, one, two, three. And now if we embed this text right inside of the three single quotes, we can see that we don't have a broken string anymore. And what I would like to do is to actually save this, the string or this text. Um, I'm going to save it in a variable, in a variable called message. Now, so far we have used the keyboard shortcut shift enter to display the value within a variable, in, in this case pet, when we entered, when we use the, the shortcut key enter, it displays the value, or when we click run, it displays the value. There is another way we can display the value within a variable, and this is using the print function, which is an inbuilt function in Python. And I'm just going to show you what that looks like. So again, we have the name of the function, which is print, and then we have parentheses and whatever we pass inside of the parentheses will be printed for us. So in this case, if I pass the variable name message, it prints out Peter said, I don't care why did it say that. So just something to keep in mind, Jupyter Notebook allows us to use the shortcut or we use run to display, uh, but a, a, a proper way would be to use the print function to print out the values within a variable. And this is something we would use more frequently as we go on in this course. Let's create a new variable. And the name of the variable will be message and assign the value of hello world to message and just execute that cell. The first string method I'd like to take a look at is the upper method. The upper method is used to change a string value to uppercase. So right now we have hello world in lowercase. If we want to change this string value to uppercase, we can use the upper method to do that. The way we do that is that we can either append or attach the upper function or one thing I would like to also clarify, even though we call this a method, remember at the core of it, it's still a function. And 
another way we can think about function is it is a block of code that allows us to perform a certain task. So instead of us writing a long piece of code to perform a, you know, a, a task in this case to change the string into uppercase, Python already has some inbuilt function that we can just take and use to achieve that purpose. So it saves us time. We don't need to code anything ourselves. We just need to apply that function and it performs that task. Okay. So if we want to change this text and we can either pass the upper function directly on the text, or we can pass it on the name of the variable, because we know that once we use that function on the name of the variable, Python still goes inside of that variable and applies that function into the values inside of that variable. So th to do that, all we need to do is we type message and then we have a period and then we have the function. When we execute this, we get hello world now in uppercase. Like I said, we can also apply the function directly on the value. So if we type hello world and now we can append the upper function and if we execute that we get hello world in uppercase. The complementary to upper is lower. So if we want to change, so right now we have this text as uh, as lowercase. Um, let's say we want to change and I'm going to create another text here. So let's say we have happy birthday and we want to convert this to lowercase. All we need to do is we append the lower function to to the to the string value. Oh, uh, sorry, this should be lower. And when we execute that, now we have happy birthday in lowercase. Another um, commonly used method is the title method. So let's say we have the text Python is fun and cool. Now we can use the title method and I'm going to execute this and show you what it, what it does. So the first letter of each word is changed to uppercase. So right here we have the P is now in uppercase. We have the I, the F, the A and C. So what the title method does, it's, it, it changes the first letter of each word to uppercase. Now, another thing I would like to point out is this. And first, what I would do is let's save this in a variable. Let's call this message three. So, and execute that. And now we can go ahead and print message three. And that gives us Python is fun and cool. And, and again, because we assigned this to message three, right? So we have each letter or well, the first letter of each word is in uppercase. Now let's, let's use, a let's use the opera method on message three. Now, when we do that, sorry, it should be message three. When we do that, we get Python is fun and cool. So what we have here has been changed to Python is fun and cool. Now, however, this method does not change the original content or the original value of message three. And I can show you that by let's print out message three again. When we execute that, we see that we still have each the first word in uppercase. And you know, so we have the first word of each letter is still in uppercase. Even though we use the upper method to change the content, it doesn't, well, it only displays the value in uppercase. So it doesn't change the original value we have inside of message three. And the reason is because strings are immutable. I'm gonna write the word out. We have um, immutable, and and we also have another word which is mutable. Immutable simply means doesn't change. So doesn't change, while mutable means changes. So whenever we apply a method to a string, as we have in this case, by applying the opera to message three, it only displays that value in uppercase. It doesn't change the original content of message three. 
Another type, um, another method I would like to show you is the capitalize method. So let's say, uh, and let's use message three again. And now we can use the capitalize method. And what this does is that it only it changes the first letter of the text or the value to uppercase. So we can see now that the the P in Python is an uppercase, but the rest are in lowercase. If we print out our original message three, we see that it's still the same. So the I is an uppercase, the F, the A, and the C. So again, the the strings are immutable, which means uh, when we apply a method to the string values, it does not change the original value. It only prints out, and it you can think of it as it prints out a new value or a new, you know, it prints out a new value for us with the method that we stipulated. Now, before we move on, I would like to quickly show you how to add comments in Jupyter Notebook or in Python in general. And the, the reason I want to bring this up now is this. Right here, I have the, you know, I wrote the words immutable, I'm mutable just to explain um, a concept to you. Now, at the moment, if we were to execute the cell, we get an invalid syntax because right now, Python is thinking that this is some sort of code, right? But we know that this is just a comment. I was just trying to explain a concept to you. So how do we ensure that Python actually recognize what we wrote here as a comment, because this is also very important. Um, once you begin to write long lines of codes, um, you, there will be times you need to like, you know, enter some comment to either describe what your code is doing. Perhaps there's someone else that has to go to your code or you're sharing work, um, your codes with someone, some, someone, or you just want to like explain each step of your code, you need to write comments. So writing comments is very common in programming languages. So how do we do that? And all we need to do is you press shift and um, the number sign on your keyboard and that should be the key three. So you just press shift and three and you get this ash sign or ash symbol and you can see that immediately this the color of this changes so now when we execute the cell again python simply ignores it because now it sees that this is a comment it's not a code so um so just keep that in mind because we'll also be doing that in subsequent lessons um now let's print our variable message which contains the value hello world now one important thing you should know in python is that Whenever you have string values, each character in the string has a position, and the position is called index. The first character has a position, the second character also has a position, and all of the characters has a position. The way we count, uh, the way we count the index position is the first character starts with index zero. The next character, index one, index two, index three, index four. The space between O and W also has an index position, and that's index five. So even though it's a white space, it does have an index position as well. W is index six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We can confirm this index position by using an index function in Python. So let's say we, we type on message and we append the index function. Let's say we want to confirm the index position of W. When we execute that, it tells us that W is index six. If we check the index position of D, it tells us that D is index 10. If we count the total number of characters, we should have 11 characters. So we have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. But the reason that D, index D, is ten is because we start our count, our index position count with zero, with the number zero. So the last character will always be one less than the total number of characters. Again, that's because we don't start our count using you know, with one, we start our count from 
zero. Let's try a few more methods and I'm just going to create more cells. The next method I would like to show you is the strip method. Before that, let's create a new variable and we'll call this message for. And what we want to do is to, let's just store the string value happy inside of message four. But I also want us to create three leaden spaces. So to do that, just press the tab three times, press tab three times. And at the end, you also want to press tab three times. So we're creating three leading and three trailing spaces. And let's save that cell. Now remember I told you that spaces also count as index, okay? We use the strip method to strip or to remove leading and trailing spaces. So right now, if I we have message four and we have the strip method, if we execute this, we get happy. So what we have in now is that is the leading and the trailing spaces has been stripped away. Uh, let's actually run Let's print out message four first. We can see that when we print this out, we have the leading and the trailing spaces. But once we apply the strip method, it strips away the three leading and the three trailing spaces. And we can confirm also that there are spaces by using another method, which is the len function. So if we pass the variable message four, and execute, it tells us that there are 11, the, what the length function does is, it tells us the total number of characters within the parenthesis. So right now we know that message four is happy, but we have the three leading at the three trailing spaces. So if we add that to, so we have one, two, three, four, five. Happy itself has five characters, but because we have three leading and three trailing spaces, it makes the, all the characters 11. So we can confirm again that um, there is the, the leading and the trailing spaces uh, counted. So what if we assign the value? So that right now we have message.strip, which strips that away, but we can find out the len of this as well. So all I did is right now I just passed the, the you know, message, the strip, you know, the strip value of message four, which should be this. I pass that inside of the len function. And when we execute this, now it tells us that it has five because the leading and the trailing spaces is stripped away using the strip function. And then once this is performed, then we use the len function to count the total number of characters inside of the values inside of a parenthesis. Format function is one of Python's inbuilt functions. We can use format function to substitute a placeholder with a value. Let's take a look at these variables. We have the variable name with a value Peter. We have age with a value 20. Hobby with a value playing football. And the last variable is message. And inside of message, we have a sentence. My name is blank. Now, this is a pair of curly brackets, and this is what we refer to as placeholder in Python. So we have, my name is blank, comma, I am blank years, and I love blank. We see that this text inside of message contains three pairs of curly brackets. And the way we get the, get curly bracket is by pressing shift bracket on your keyboard. We can use the format function to substitute the curly bracket with the three, with the variables we have in na as name, age, and obby. And that's why we have three curly brackets. So we have my name is blank and, and we have the values of name will now be replaced or substituted with a space. I am blank years, that will be age, and I love blank. For us to use the format function, all we need to do is append. So we start with a period and then we type our format function. Now inside the parenthesis, we have to pass the three variables or the three values that we want to substitute with the place 
folders. So in this case, the first value is name, the second value is age, and the last value will be Abby. And let's, um, let's execute the cell to save all those values. Now, when we print message, and let's do that, and we'll use the print function and execute, we see that the three place orders has been replaced with the values we have in the format function. So now we have my name is Peter, I am 20 years, and I love playing football. Now for the format function to work, the number of place orders we have in our string has to match the number of arguments or the number of values we've indicated in the format function. So we can't, for instance, have three place orders and then pass two values. If we do this, we get an error message. So we have to uh, ensure that the number of place orders match the number of values that we indicate in the format function. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and save that again. Another thing I would like to point out is each value we pass inside of the format function also has an index position. So we talked about indexing earlier on. So the first value is index zero, the second value is index one, and the third value is index two. And this is important because if we choose to, we can act, we can manipulate what gets placed inside of this place order. I'm going to copy this and let's take a look at this again. So what we can do now is we can use the index position. We can enter the index position in each of those place order and that works as well. So let's say for instance, we want to say, and this doesn't make sense, but let's say we want to say my name is, um, and, and for my name, instead of using index zero, we use index one. And then I am index zero, and then I love index three, sorry, index two. Let's enter that. Now when we print message, let's see what happens. We see that my name is 20. So now because we indicated within this place order the, an index position of one, what we get is age is now substituted with a first place order. And I am Peter's years old, that's the name. I love playing football, okay? And like I said, this doesn't make sense. So I'm just going to copy this back and just run that, okay? So let's print out our message again. And we have my name is Peter, I am 20 years, and I love, I love playing football. Another good thing about using the format function, but first creating our variables is, if we need to make any change to this string or to the sentence, we don't have to go into, we don't have to make any changes in, in, within this variable. All we need to do, let's say for instance, uh, um, Peter's age changes to 21, and Peter's RB changes to swimming. All we need to do is update our variable and let's save that. And now when we print out message, we see that the name, the, the age has been updated to 21 and the RB has been updated to swimming. Okay, I'm not sure if you know this, but just in case you don't, you are amazing. In less than one hour, you have come a long way and learned a lot about Python. This is a lot of information you've had to grasp within a short period. And the fact that you're still here shows how committed you are to learning Python. So thanks a lot for your time, congratulations, and you are amazing. We're going to spend another 30 minutes to build on your Python skills. We will learn how to convert variables from one data type into another data type. This is called casting. And then we will work together on an exciting mini project where we get to create a bill payment interactive system using all of the things we've learned and some additional things that we'll be learning shortly. But before we continue, I would like to take a quick moment to touch on two of the most asked questions I get from students once they complete this course. The first question is, what else do I need to learn to take my knowledge of Python to the next level or become an expert in Python? 
The second question I get from students is, besides Python, what other skills or applications do I need to become a data professional? So whether a data scientist, a data analyst, business analyst, or really just work in any data related field. By the end of this beginner course, you certainly would have learned a lot in Python and acquired some foundational knowledge. However, there are areas of Python not covered in this course. For example, Pandas library, which is one of the most important, in fact, the main area of Python used for data analysis. To fully equip you, I have a carefully created and structured beginner to advanced level Python course that takes your knowledge of Python to the next level and puts you on the path towards becoming a data scientist, a data analyst, a business analyst, business intelligence developer, or work in any data related field. I really want to be a part of your success story of transitioning into the field of data analytics. I have provided a coupon that allows you to register for the Python for Data Analytics Beginner to Advanced Level course at a discount of only $12.99. In addition, when you register using the coupon, I will give you free access to my Excel and Tableau courses. And this leads me to the second most asked question, which is, what else do I need to learn to become a data professional? Four of the most needed skills you need to become a data professional are Python, SQL, Excel, and Tableau. Besides Python, SQL is one of the most used application for data analytics. In fact, your journey to becoming a data professional isn't complete without knowing SQL. Excel is also very important. Sometimes the data you need to analyze may come as an Excel or CSV file, and you need to know how to clean, manipulate, and analyze data in Excel. Tableau is one of the most powerful applications used for data visualization, and there is an increase in demand for data professionals to have the ability to create visualizations of analyzed data. By registering for the Python for Data Analysis Beginner to Advanced Level course for only $12.99, you can now learn Excel and Tableau free. I also have an SQL course and I will provide a coupon for the SQL course as well. If your goal is to work in any data related field, you definitely want to take advantage of this limited offer. The coupon links and instructions on registering can be found in the resources folder. Also, at the end of this course, I will walk you through the content of the Python for Data Analysis Beginner to Advanced Level course. Now, let's continue coding in Python. There are times we may need to change our data from one data type to another data type. This is called casting in Python. We know that the number five is an integer and we can confirm this by using the type function. If we pass the number five inside of the function, it tells us this is an integer. And the same way we know that 3.5 is a float data type. When we use the type function, we get float. What if we want to change a value from an integer to a float data type? The first function I'd like us to take a look at is the float function. So we have float and then we have the pair of close open and close parentheses and any value we pass inside of this float function will be changed into a float data. So let's pass the value of five. When we execute, Python return this as 5.0. What if we want to cast a float data into an integer? We can use the int data int function to do that. And that's simply int. And then we have the open and close parenthesis. So let's pass the value of 34.5 and see what happens. So we get a va an output of 34. To cast the value 34.5 into an integer, Python simply ignores any value after the decimal point, and then we get 34. We can use the string function to convert a value 
for instance, an integer into a string data type. Let's say we have the value of 90. When we execute, what Python does is it simply embeds the value in parentheses inside either single or double quote. And we know that anything we pass inside single or double quotes is a string. Now you may be asking why would you want to change a data from a particular data type to another data type. Consider these telephone numbers and these are three different ways in which we can write, write or represent telephone numbers. Assuming we are a, a service provider and we need people to enter their telephone number, the first person comes in and write the number in this, in this way and this will be considered an integer. But if you look at the second way, we have these two dashes in between the, you know, the first three. After the first three numbers, we have this dash and then we have another dash here. Now, this will not pass as an integer because of these dashes. Also, we have in parentheses the first three numbers and then we have this dash. On our end, for structure, we may want to have all this telephone number to be in the same format. So to do that, instead of having people enter, well, the people will enter the values whichever way they want to, but we can then store those values all in, as a string. Because now, once we enter, once we pass this in, in, in double quotes or single quotes, this, this then becomes a string data type and then which makes it easier for us on the back end to process this particular value. What if we want to cast a boolean value or, or cast boolean into string? We can also do that. So we have our str that represents string. And if we pass a, a boolean value like true, we now get true. This has been converted into a string. We can also, I'm going to show you this, if we, let's, if we use the int function on a boolean value, let's use it on true, we get one. If we use it on false, we get zero. So that's just another thing that, you know, just to, to point out, we can cast a boolean value, in our case, true or false. But when we cast it as an integer, we get one for true and we get zero for false. All right, for this project, we want to create a bill payment interactive system. The way the system works is this. Once a user logs into their account to check their account balance, we want to ask some questions to verify who they are and subsequently provide their account balance. Listed here is some of the steps we need to take to get this project going. The first thing is I would like us to create a variable. So we'll create a variable and the name of the variable will be account balance. Next, we'll create another variable with the name due date. For the account balance, you can actually impute any amount you wish. Same for the due date, you can enter in a date as well. Now, to, before we provide account information to the customer, we want to make sure we are providing the information to the right account holder. So we need to confirm certain information. And for this, we just need to confirm the customer's name. Once we do that, we will create a variable and I would explain why we're creating this variable as we work on the project. Then this next step is to, we want to greet the customer, sort of like some complimentary message before we go ahead and perform any type of task. And the next step would then be to ask if the user wants, if they want to find out about the account balance. And if they do want to do that, then we provide that account information to, or the account balance to the user. All right, so let's create our first variable and the variable will be account balance. Okay, so for me, I'm just making the account balance $250. Now, um, the reason I'm putting this in strings is because we have the dollar sign. Um, so, you know, it just makes sense to have that in string. Next, let's create another variable and this would be due date. All right, so we have the due date as for me, it's January 25, 2021. Again, you can use any value for both the account balance and the due date. Now for the step three, which is to confirm the customer's name. 
We will use something we've not used before, which is an input function. Now, input function helps us to accept an input from a user, so we can ask a user a question, and when the user enters their response, the response is stored. I'm going to show you how to do that. So we type input, and because it's a function, we have our open and close parenthesis. And now the question we want to ask, and I'm just going to say, um, let's just say, hey there, please confirm your name, All right? And I'll just um, have a semicolon there and a space, and I'll explain why we're doing that shortly. So to explain the input function again, the way it works is this. We have this message inside of the function, right? Inside of the parenthesis, rather. What happens is that once we execute this, this now, this will be presented to, in our case, a customer, and then the customer is supposed to enter their name. So now once this is ex executed, let's say the customer enters the name as Alex, and I enter this, what happens is that the value or the name Alex is now stored within this input function. So it kind of like, cap it captures that, the, the value that's been presented. And this is why we need to create a variable so that we can store this value inside of this variable. So what we can do here is we can say name equals, um, I'm just gonna copy all of those input statements. So if we, so any answer or any response we get from the customer will be stored inside of the variable name. All right, so let's run this again. So it's gonna ask, hey there, please confirm your name. And now let's say the name is Peter. I'm just gonna use a different name. Peter, right? So that's been entered. And I can confirm, I can verify or prove to you that Peter has now been stored in name if we, and all we need to do for that is let's say, let's print out, P, let's print out name. If I print this out, we get Peter, right? So it shows us that the value that has been entered by our potential customer has been stored inside of this variable name, okay? The next step is to greet our customer and we want to greet them by their name. So self to, to we want to personalize our greetings, right? So to do that, all we need to do is, and we'll use the print function, but let's, I'm gonna write out the text for first and let's say, once say welcome, welcome back and we want to use their name, right? So we can have welcome back and then we can uh, use the, we can concatenate that with a name of the customer and all we need to do now is just type name right so let's use our print function to to do that and, okay so we get welcome back peter and let's just make a space here so we get welcome back peter okay and um, the next step then would be to ask if you ask the, the customer if they would like to know their account balance so the next step is we want to use the input function again to ask the customer if they would like to know their account balance. And I want us to create a variable for this as well. And we just call the variable message. So the message will be equal, will be equal to the input of, and um, now we'd ask our, quest, ask our customer if they would like to know their account balance. So just say, would you like account balance question mark there so now once we execute this then um, we're going to pretend the customer says yes so yes will now be stored inside of message all right so the last step the last step here is we want to provide the account balance to the customer so i will create another variable and let's call this balance info so like balance information. So then what we want to do is we want to print out the, uh, the account information, but we also want to include the name of the customer, okay? So for that, so now let's provide the account detail or account, the balance information. Okay, so let's take a look at this. 
So what we have here is we we want to tell we want to provide the account information to the to the customer, right? So we have sure, and now we have a placeholder that's going to the name will be imputed into this placeholder because it's it's the first position. So then we have your your balance is, and then we have the account balance will be imputed into the second placeholder, all right? So let's execute that to save that, and now we can print. If we print balance information, we get sure Peter, your account balance is two hundred and fifty dollars. Now, if we want to be even fancy, we can capitalize Peter, right? We can make this capital P. To do that, what we can do is right here where we have the name, we can just append the capitalize method. So if we go dot capitalize, okay. And let's save that. So now if we print this out, we can see that the name Peter is now capitalized or in uppercase. Oh, by the way, I want us to also include the due date. So right after this placeholder, we can say, and your due date is, and now we add the third placeholder. And now we can add I'm going to see we have due date due underscore date. Okay. So let's save that. So now if we run this again, we have the complete statement. So sure, Peter, your account balance is $250 and your due date is January 25, 2021. All right. I'd like to take this moment to say a big congratulations to you. From knowing little or nothing about Python, you now have a solid foundation you can build on. You really should be proud of yourself and you should also celebrate this moment. The next topic is providing you some tips on what you may not know about transitioning into a data related field. My assumption is that most of you, if not all, attending this workshop are interested in a career in data. The first tip I would like to give is that you should set realistic goals. And I say this because I'm sure I'm not the only one that I've seen ads on different social media platform with taglines claiming a fast turnaround from knowing nothing about a specific discipline to getting a job in that field. So you will see ads like become a data scientist in three months or become a data analyst in, in, in three months or in two months. Now, is it possible to learn the core requirement in a specific field within three months? Maybe, but in my opinion, it does take time to learn the core requirements, apply for jobs, and then go through a bunch of multiple, you know, a bunch of interviews before eventually getting a job. Now, perhaps you might be wondering realistically how long it takes to make that switch. And my response is, it, oh, it really depends. I can tell you from my own experience that it took about eight months to transition from a, a, a financial advisory position into a, a data related position. So uh, again, it, it could take you longer, it could take you not as much, but it does take time because like I said earlier on, one, you're learning about the skill set. Once you feel confident and you never really feel confident, even when you know everything, you still always feel like there's more to learn, which I will talk about shortly, but it, it does take time. And then when you start applying for jobs, you would not, you know, pass through some of those job interviews, but eventually, you know, I finally got a position. So, and I say all of this so that you don't get frustrated as you embark on this amazing and rewarding journey um, and you're not swayed or carried away by all the ads that talks about getting a job in three months or landing this in three months. It does take time. Maybe there are some people that are able to do it in three months, but I would argue that most people take more time, you know, again, could be up to a year, could be less than a year, but you know, the whole thing about three months is not... It's not realistic in my opinion. The next thing I like to talk about is that you are always learning. Within the IT space, the IT space is fast moving, which means things get obsolete quickly and there is always a need to evolve, otherwise you get left behind. And that means that if your goal is to remain in this field for a long time, then you need to be open to the idea of always learning. 
The good news is once you learn, for instance, one programming language, it becomes easier to learn another one. So, you know, right now you're learning Python. If you choose to learn SQL, the time it's going to take you to learn SQL will be much shorter because a lot of the structure and foundation are the same. So it's going to be much easier for you to learn a new programming language. The next thing will be you really want to know the general job requirement of what you're applying for. So, I mean, right now you're taking a bold step to learn Python, which is great. However, if your goal is to work in a data related field, you would need to know more than Python. Rarely would you see a job post that only requires Python. Usually you'd have some sort of combination of Python, SQL, R, um, Excel might be thrown inside of that as well. And there's also the expectation, you know, nowadays for data professionals to create visualization of their data analysis, which means that you would also see job posts requiring, requiring Tableau or, or Power BI experience. And these are data visualization applications. My recommendation is that you learn Python, SQL, Excel, and Tableau. Since you are already learning Python, you can learn SQL next. In fact, you can structure your learning in a way that you learn Python and SQL at the same time. Once you complete Python and SQL, you can learn Excel and finally Tableau or Power BI. Also, you, you don't necessarily need to know everything. A lot of times you get to learn on the job. There are so many ways, Python or SQL, Excel, all of those applications, there's so many uses to them. And, and, and usually once you're on the job, you're really only work using a, a particular feature or function of those applications. So trying to learn everything is close to impossible. What you really need to do is to learn the most important piece applicable to the field you're going into. So for instance, with Python, and, and we've mentioned this before, Python, there's so many uses for, of, of Python. So now we know that you want to focus on, you know, Python for data analysis, but even within that, what are the core things? What are the things you need to learn? You know, for instance, Pandas library is the core data analysis um, app, um, library for Python. So you need to know, you know, how to work with Pandas, but even within Pandas, what do you want to focus on? Because again, there's so many things that you can do within just that single library. So instead of trying to know everything, the most important thing is learning the core things, the things that most you're most likely going to use, or at least that, you know, that during an interview process, you may be tested on. Also, your first job may not necessarily be exactly what you're looking for. And by that, I mean, so let's say for instance, your goal is to become a data scientist. It is possible that your, your first job would be a data analyst role, right? Or a business intelligence analyst role. And that is fine because usually once you're on the job, you will be interacting with colleagues that are in your desired field. And that gives you a better understanding of what they do, what a data scientist do on a daily basis. And you can build those relationships, which would eventually help you get to where, you, you know, what your goal or where you want to get to. So it's all about getting into the industry. Well, maybe not solely about getting into the, into, into that field, uh, sorry, into that industry. But once you're inside of that space, then it really just becomes much easier for you to transition into whatever your goal is, be it a data scientist, a data analyst, business analyst, um, ETL specialist, database administrator, whatever it is, all you need is just get that first job into that field. Once you're within the IT space, then it becomes way easier.